Okay. Um, so this is going to be a little bit different. Um, be prepared because we're going to ask you to move around. You're not going to stay where you are now, so you're going to bring everything with you because when this session ends, we're going to start the breakouts and you're going to be distributed to three other rooms too. So to start off with, though, I'm going to introduce the other two speakers that are going to be participating in this learning activity with you all. This is joint learning where you all are participating actively in the process. So we have Dr. Gwen McGinnis, who is the non-human primate specialist with the USDA APHIS Center for Animal Welfare. She received her doctorate in veterinary medicine from the University of California, Davis. Uh, she completed a primate re medicine residency at the California National Primate Research Center and worked at the Oregon National Primate Research Center and in GLP toxicology laboratories. Um, here in the U.S. And then we have Dr. Gary Borkowski. Dr. Borkowski is Senior Director for ALAC International. He received his veterinary degree from Ohio State University and a master's... Iowa State, I'm sorry, not the Ohio State, Iowa State, sorry, and a master's degree in laboratory animal medicine from Penn State University, my alma mater. Uh, he has 30 years of experiment, experience in academic and pharmaceutical laboratory animal medicine, has worked at Vanderbilt, Penn State, uh, Monsanto, Pfizer, and Lilly Research Labs, and of course, as you all know, is presented in many forums and has uh, served as in multiple roles uh, for many of the, the national societies, such as ALAS, ASLAP, and ACLAM. And of course, he's board certified in laboratory animal medicine. So without further ado, I will just say I'm Pat Brown. I'm the director of OLA. I've been there for over 10 years now. Seems like a lifetime, um, but it's all good. So, here we go. Our goals for this session, hopefully I can read it from here, and you can still hear me. Uh, we are going to explore the challenges of social housing and environmental enrichment to enhance our understanding of the physical, physiologic, and behavioral uh, needs there, that's better, of social species in order to maximize opportunities for social animals to express species-specific behaviors. Our objectives, we're going to analyze some scenarios involving social housing and enrichment and determine if they are subject to citation by USDA, reportable to OLA, or considered as a significant or a suggestion for improvement or mandatory uh, for correction by ALAC. And then lastly, depending on your scenario, you're going to develop a corrective action plan if it's needed, uh, uh, or if you think it's all okay, then it may just be all okay. So what you're going to do first, look at the number on your name badge. Everybody, as you came in, you should have a number on your name badge. That represents, that represents the table you're going to move to. So you're going to take all your stuff with you. Faculty have the option of staying where they are or going to the back of the room and just hanging out and relaxing. Um, but there's case, the case studies are back there on the back tables, too, for them. So please move to your corresponding numbered table. Take all the stuff with you. As I said, this is a permanent move. And then at the end of this, you'll be going to your breakouts. Our next step. Each table has been given a scenario. Table nine, you have, a, you have been reassigned to do, that we don't have a ninth scenario. So table nine has to do uh, scenario number two. And table 10 has to do scenario number five. Everybody else, your table number repre represents the case study that you're going to do. There should be a pile of case studies on the table that you can pass around. If there is not enough case studies, we have some extras in the back of the room on the tables back there. Does anybody not have a case study? Okay, so you're going you're gonna to read your case study, you're going to discuss it and decide, is it subject to, to citation by USDA? Is it reportable to OLA as noncompliance? Is it considered a suggestion for improvement or mandatory for correction by ALAC? Develop a correction action plan if needed, and then we will report out by tables. So 
go ahead and start discussing. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have each table report out, and then each of us is going to give the perspective from our um, side of the house, or whatever you want to call it, on the scenario. And as was pointed out by one of the tables, some of, the, some of these case studies are actually not noncompliance or whatever, but they still may be something that an iCook faces as a challenge and your institution faces as a challenge. And so that's where we're hoping that you all in your discussion recognize that but would still want to say what you think the next steps would be for that particular situation. Okay? So here we go. Case study one. This is always better if I read it from here. A dog being exercised in an outdoor enclosure gets its head caught in a gate between two exercise areas. The animal caretaker, in an attempt to free the animal, applies a lubricant on the dog's head and neck. Within two days, the animal exhibits dermal injuries in the areas where the lubricant was applied. So uh, Christine is going to come around with a microphone for the table to report out what their findings were. Do you guys have a... You're giving us your assessment of the situation, whether it's something that's citable, something that needs to be reported. Um, well, we do not think it's something that is citable, but we are going to report it. Uh, because we, we, look, here, you do this. <laughs> no! <laughs> Um, so we are going to report it to the USDA, but we don't think it's a citable offense, um, especially if it's the first time it's happened. Um, and it come before and inspected and it's never been exactly. a problem. And in this scenario, we're also an ALAC accredited facility, so they've inspected too. So it's, the facility's been inspected before. It's never been brought to anyone's attention before that that was not an approved run exercise area. Um, we said no, right? We're, oh, we're going to call. <laughs> Look, see, I'm on the spot. So that, That's OK. I'm on the spot, too. We, we did say that uh, we were going to call Ola um, and have a conversation with them. Mm -hmm. um, and we, it's probably not going to be considered a suggestion for improvement or mandatory correction by ALAC because we're going to self-correct prior to having another inspection. And we have a corrective action plan. Okay. So you should have been the speaker. So, so in the corrective action plan, um, we're going to stop use of the area. Um, we're going to potentially monitor dogs in that area in the future, change the exercise program, um, figure out, you know, was someone watching the dog when the head got stuck in the first place, or how long was he out there, or was there another reason that that happened, um, find out if it ever happened again or if it's happened previously um, to that instance, um, because if it's a repeated problem, you're going to treat it differently than if it's a single event. Um, and then we're also going to try to find out, you know, just to check our bases, whether the injuries were related to the lubricant or him getting his head caught, because it doesn't really give much of a definition either way. Okay, thank you. Here. Good job. Good job. Okay, from a USDA perspective, this is actually something that may be citable. Um, one of the reasons why is if the enclosure was not structurally sound or it became in disrepair, it wasn't maintained as it should have been maintained, and that was what led to the dog getting its head caught. 
um, then that's an animal that was injured because the facilities weren't maintained as they should have been maintained. But it could have also been a dog with maybe an unusually narrow head or a dog that was more inclined to investigate things and got himself in that in spite of the facility being in good repair. So it just kind of depends on, on what the underlying reason was for the dog getting its head caught. And if it, um, if it was because uh, that area of the facility was not structurally sound, it would be non-compliant with 3.1a. Um, also, if the, when those burns were identified or the dermal lesions were identified, uh, our expectation is that a veterinarian would be contacted. So if the veterinarian were not contacted to assess that, then that would be non-compliant with um, 2.33b3. Uh, it would be reportable to OLA, so calling OLA is always the best thing to do. When in doubt, call OLA. We'll tell you whether you have to report it or not. Okay, because the condition jeopardized the health of the animals, and that's the bottom line for us. There may be circumstances where we tell you it's not reportable, but it's still better off to call us in this kind of situation. Okay, and what we would expect would be that um, you prevent future occurrences. As you said, you, may, you came up with lots of good ideas on how you would address this and possibly a, a training on available emergency supplies too. Don't just grab the lube that may actually be um, used for cars. You know, something that actually could cause a dermal burn. So, uh, you know, that, that's, that comes down to training. So as you so appropriately pointed out, you were looking at this programmatically. And uh, let me just make the disclaimer, as you've heard, if you're from an accredited institution, that all decisions regarding findings are made by the Council on Accreditation. So we're here assuming we understand how that works. And I'd say you probably have a good idea if you're from an accredited institution. So. Um, what, I'm, what I've set, set up here in writing is pretty much what you said, is that we'd expect appropriate veterinary care agreeing with uh, Pat and Gwen as well, and then an assessment of that area, as you, as you talked about. And, uh, you know, looking for programmatically uh, what happened and then preventing it in the future. So good job. Okay, scenario two. Um, facility X has pair housing listed as the default housing strategy for non-human primates in their written environment enhancement plan. An investigator is requesting IACUC approval for single housing in order to be able to monitor stool quality because everyone knows primates often get diarrhea. All right, I'm giving you the oh, Thank you. I'm going to sit while I do this. Um, okay, so we decided that, uh, actually we looked at this and we felt that we were probably putting the cart before the horse or the banana before the monkey, whatever you're thinking. Um, and that actually what was really needed was an IACUC review uh, where they looked at uh, the scientific justification um, and uh, whether those, um, uh, whether the, uh, the needs of this were, were met the regulations uh, and uh, the various regulations and or their assurance. Um, and then they also, the IACUC might even ask questions about the, the program of veterinary care, get a report from the attending veterinarian, uh, discuss the rate of diarrhea in the, the population to see if it was unusual. Um, so for the USDA and OLA, the, we would not report this uh, unless this process was not followed or the PI went ahead and did this without approval. Uh, for ALAC, we thought this might be a, a possible suggestion for, for improvement if, for example, the psychological well-being program was perceived as weak, uh, if the ICUC went ahead and approved this, but we felt, they felt that uh, maybe that was, that was uh, too lenient or, or not uh, in the spirit of the regulations. Thank you. From a USDA perspective, this is not citable if it... Uh, receives IACUC approval, the Animal Welfare Get Act gives the IACUC authority to determine if those justifications are adequate. Um, and this is um, uh, 3.8, it's actually 3.81 uh, E2, saying that the committee can exempt an individual primate from the Environment Enhancement Plan 
for scientific reasons with justification. And for OLA's perspective, this is not reportable. But if we did a site visit and we found that your institution was uh, not, didn't have a very strong um, program for uh, social housing, had a lot of single housed animals without a really reasonable justif scientific justification, then uh, we, would, we would be asking you to make improvements to that program. And this just reiterates what the expectation is from the guide that, that is our standard for facilities that are uh, PHS funded. So looking at the situation, uh, as uh, Dr. Shukan representing Table 2 said, you know, what's going on at that institution with the animals? Uh, one of the comments I have up here is, as we heard, uh, and many of you knew this before coming to this conference, isolating a social animal can be stressful, so that could in a, you know, in, interfere with the animal and cause diarrhea. So separating it because it might get diarrhea seems almost contrary to, to the situation. So really, back to what you said, that, you know, the veterinarian should be involved with this, looking at the, what's going on with the, the clinical case of the animals uh, as to whether or not it would be appropriate to separate this animal out. Okay, so going on to the next case study. During the semi-annual facility inspection of the rodent facility, the ICUC site visitors find several cages of rodents housed singly. Following review of the animal study protocol, the committee determines that single housing was without ICUC approval. So table three. Uh, so we just, we determined for the, is it subject to citation by the USDA that it would not be because these are rodents and so they're non-covered non species by the, the Animal Welfare Act. Um, for question number two, um, is it reportable to OLA as a non-compliance? Our answer was most likely yes, um, assuming that the institute has an assurance because it deviates from the guide, so we would call OLA to check. Um, and then is it considered a suggestion for improvement or mandatory for correction by ALAC? Um, we thought that this would probably be a suggestion for improvement. Um, it's not every, every rodent cage, but you know, maybe this is kind of scratching the surface on some kind of uh, underlying problem or um, you know, programmatic issue. And then develop a correction plan if needed, so we would check develop a system to kind of recheck the protocols that are, you know, in the institute, make amendments if necessary, if these animals do need to be so, um, single housed, and then also improve, um, let's see, improve documentation and monitoring uh, to try to catch this before, you know, these rodents get, are, are single housed, and then maybe even try to get to the root, well, not maybe try, get to the root of the problem to try to decide if this is a, a, a problem with a specific protocol or if this is more of a programmatic issue like with um, you know, care staff or the, the veterinary staff, for example. So. Oh, the whole thing came up. So, um, Right up until Friday, I had the same thing that you said about it not being citable because uh, rodents aren't covered species, but actually it's just uh, mice of the genus mus and rats of the genus ratus that are not covered. So it could be a different species of mice. The question just said rodents, and, and so when I was reviewing it and thinking about it more, I thought, oh yeah, there, there actually are some covered rodents. And um, so, whether it's citable is going to depend on a couple things. Why they were separated. If they were separated for veterinary reasons, they've got open clinical cases, then that wouldn't be citable. If they were separated for incompatibility, then actually separating them would be in compliance with um, 3.133, which states that housed, co-housed animals uh, must be compatible. Uh, if they were separated due to study activity, then it may be citable. Um, 2.31 D1 states that the ICUC shall review all activities including animals. So if it, it sounds the way it was worded in the scenario that the ICUC had not rev reviewed that activity. Um, because it was identified on uh, an ICUC inspection, um, 
It would also depend on whether the issue is cited. If the IACUC comes up with a correction plan, then the facility has to um, follow that correction plan. And if they did not follow the correction plan, then um, they would not be compliant with 2.31C3. So there are some possible sort of peripheral issues there, um, but the likelihood of it being citable is pretty low. Okay, so for Ola, it would be reportable uh, because they failed to adhere to the IACUC approved protocol if that was the finding when, when it was looked into by the, uh, by the um, further investigation by the IACUC. So um, we would expect corrective actions that they would modify the protocol and get it approved with assuming there was a scientific justification for single housing the animal. If it was a medical condition, um, we would want to confirm ongoing veterinary oversight, and in that case, it would not be reportable. So it, it really comes down to doing something without IACUC approval that's scientific-based versus for the veterinary reason or, or um, incompatibility reason, again, a call, the call of the veterinarian. Those do not need to be reported to us. And uh, as I said, it's, it's really uh, further investigation would need it on this particular case. Thanks. So I broke this out into if this was something seen during a site visit, which is a relatively common finding uh, when site visits occur because most facilities have a large number of rodents, we'll find uh, cages of rodents that are singly housed, and then if we go back and see that the protocol did not include that, it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, as I said, you know, council makes the final determination, and you use the term programmatic. So if, if the site visitors determined there were pro programmatic failures like a lack of an SOP or found that the PIs just singly housed just because they felt like it, then it could rise to a level of a mandatory. If it was kind of a one-off, which, you know, this, Sounds like a one-off, but it said several cages, so we don't really know how many that was. But uh, it's hard to know from standing up here whether it be a suggestion or a mandatory, but it could certainly uh, be, be brought up as a mandatory. And then the, the last paragraph was, if this was something that was read during the uh, program description review in the me meeting minutes, then just like you talked about, that things would have been corrected within the program to make sure this is not a recurring issue. Okay, case study four, table four. Two fem female macaques have been successfully paired for two years when they have a fight and are immediately separated. One female sustains multiple superficial abrasions to the head and mild bleed bruising. The other has no lesions. The facility manager contacts the veterinarian who decides to put the pair back together. Care staff are directed to monitor the pair for compatibility 15 minutes twice daily. Observations are documented and reported to the veterinarian. No other altercations are noted. The injured female is found dead with severe trauma three days later. Table four. Okay, so it depends on how you're reading this and how much information you have. So um, as far as is it subject to citation by USDA, it depends on whether or not this is something that is happening, has happened more than once, and it's a little hard to tell from this. If in fact, uh, if you look at, I guess it's paragraph 3.81, A, social grouping, number one, if non-human primate exhibits vicious or overly aggressive behavior or is debilitated as a result of age or other conditions like arthritis, it should be housed separately. So that it would depend in this case what the records look like, how the behaviors has been involved, and what's been going on with these animals. If they have been successfully paired for two years, and this is the first incident of any fighting between them, then we would say, no, it is um, not subject to a citation by the USDA. But in fact, if the records show that this has been going on, and you've got one animal that's overly aggressive, then it would be yes. So there you go. We're, we're walking right in the line, you know, right, staying right on the fence on this one, okay? 
All right. Is it reportable to OLAW for noncompliance? So again, depending on what the history is uh, for this particular pair, I would say that um, we would certainly call OLA about this. It's a non-human primate. We would ask their opinion, and again, depending on what was going on in this particular case. Um, and is it considered a suggestion for improvement or mandatory for correction by ALAC? Again, we don't make that decision. We would certainly be looking into this. The IACUC would know about it and would set up some corrective actions. We had a bunch of questions. Oh, of course. Okay, so we had a bunch of questions that were, um, how, how extensive was the examination? Uh, was there significant head trauma that caused this that was more than originally detected? Um, was there any exertional myopathy involved in this? We, you know, we don't know. Again, we don't know how extensive the physical exam was. Uh, should more monitoring have been performed than what was recommended? Uh, was there a record review including, you know, the behavioral records of these animals? Was there a behaviorist evaluation? So there's a whole bunch of other things that could be done with a corrective action. So did we give you a good non-answer on that? <laughs> no, that was great. That was great. <coughs> so from a USDA perspective, and I, I get questions about this one quite a bit because there's an expectation to meet social needs, but at the same time, there's language in the regulations that animals, sh that primates should not be co-housed if they're not compatible. And this, this scenario is not citable. The reason why it's not citable is because when it comes to compatibility and assessing compatibility that needs to be done um, in conjunction with actual observations of the animals. So it can't be one of those scenarios where we had animals that were fighting and, you know, we have people in there two, three times a day doing husbandry and doing research activities and they didn't notice anything when they were in there. That's not considered actual observations of their compatibility. And then it also needs to be as directed as by the attending veterinarian. And so both of those things occurred in that scenario. So from a USDA perspective, that's not citable. From an OLA perspective, it would not be reportable if it was a single event, <coughs> okay? If there was a repeated occurrence um, and there was serious harm or death, then we would really want you to call us and talk it through with us so we got a sense of, the, of what was going on with your program. Uh, we would hope for, that the corrective actions taken would be to identify causes and hopefully modify groups or pairs um, uh, based on further investigation of what was going on with the behavior of the animals. That's primarily if it was repeated incidents of animals being harmed or killed because of um, the uh, incompatibility issues. So I, <clears throat> excuse me, I picked some wording here from uh, one of our FAQs. It says the staff responsible for the day-to-day -day management and oversight of the social experience of the research animals should be well-versed in recognizing aggressive and affiliated behaviors of the various species in their care to provide rapid identification and, and the necessary intervention. And you guys kind of talked through that. Uh, you know, you had a pretty good explanation of what was going on in there, what, what you looked at uh, upon the death of the animal. So um, I, I would agree with what you said. And then there's, there's more wording here. The Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee or comparable oversight body and veterinarian should periodically review the strategies providing social housing or other social experience to the animals of the institution to ensure conformance with the guide. And then um, this almost goes without saying, but you know we never want to have an animal that's in a social ex experience have injury or death, but uh, sometimes that happens as we're trying to meet their needs. Okay, case study five. As part of a new research direction for a macaque mother infant bonding and development study, the investigator submits an amendment requesting approval for six weekly sedations of the macaque mothers with required eight hour periods of separation for the nursing infants. Um, so we, uh, this is very similar to the, the second case study. We felt also that this is something, it's, since it's an amendment being submitted, 
Um, nothing has been done yet, so there's no like action having happened yet. Um, so the IACUC, it would be up to them whether or not to approve it. We feel they would not likely approve it. It would, could be um, a category E situation from the infant's perspective, from a pain and suffering standpoint, not being addressed. Um, and so we don't think there's a citation involved or a non-compliance involved or even a correction action involved, but probably n the veterinarian would want to sit down and discuss with that investigator uh, the sort of psychology involved and the history of those kinds of studies and um, with Harlow and all that stuff. So um, that's kind of where we ended up on it. So from a USDA perspective, um, this is not, the activity itself would not be citable if it's approved by the IACUC, because um, again, they have the authority in terms of whether or not they feel like the study justifies the activity. However, um, there might be additional considerations under 3.81C1, that's the one that requires special considerations for infants um, in order to um, enrich their environment to promote their psychological well-being. And then also there might be considerations under 2.131B1, which is handling that, um, that says that animals need to be handled in a, in a way that minimizes distress. Um, so those might come into play depending on how the separations are conducted and how the infants are cared for while separated from their moms. So, not reportable if I cook approved, but would, are there refinements that could be considered? And this is where the veterinarian and the IA cook needs to get involved. And is it really necessary for that eight hour period of time for those infants to be separated? Are there other ways to make it happen? Uh, the timing of the sedations, do they really have to do six? Okay. Um, are there surrogates? Are there things that the animals could be given to help them manage the separation period, visual or tactile as access uh, to the moms possibly during the separation, or is that based on the science, is that not allowed? As I said, it's really, this comes back to the discussion between the IACUC, the veterinarian, and the PI to really get to the, to the nitty gritty and refine the, the study to the best welfare of the animals. So my short answer is ditto to what uh, Pat and Gwen just said, and this is uh, the wording that really, as your table said, is you know you really need to understand what's going on with the study here, understand the needs, the scientific needs, understand what alternatives might be possible to meet the scientific outcomes while still optimizing the, the welfare of the animals, both the mother and the infant. Okay, case study six. The veterinarian has placed several overweight dogs on an exercise program involving, do involving daily treadmill walking using positive reinforcement. The dogs are pair housed in large runs more than twice the size required for individual dogs. Table six. Um, in this it is not su subject to citation by USDA, and it's not reportable as non-compliance because there is no non-compliance. And there is no suggestion for improvement or mandatory by ALAC. However, um, what we discussed is uh, did the veterinarian consult the PI before putting the dogs on the treadmill because it may have interfered with the, any study that was going on. Um, it's possible that maybe the program needs to have a um, some kind of a feeding protocol if they've got several overweight dogs. And they perhaps need an exercise SOP and perhaps the IACOC should be informed about what the veterinarian is doing, not for approval, just for information. Thank you. So from a USDA perspective, I, I agree it's not citable. There is language in the regulations prohibiting use of treadmills for, um, to meet the exercise requirement, 
but these dogs being put on the treadmill is not being done to meet the exercise requirement. The scenario describes them having being pair housed in caging that's large enough to meet the exercise requirement. And then they're also, I'm sorry, I should have clicked on that one more time. And they're also being exercised in accordance with um, veterinary oversight for um, their health and well-being. So it's not reportable, as you all said. Um, it's a medical directive, and if it's an if the animals are trained, um, then it would be in the animal's best interest. You can't just throw a dog on a treadmill and uh, without doing some training. Uh, and the guide, of course, states that caloric management, uh, which can affect physiologic adaptations and other metabolic responses, can be achieved by reducing food intake or by stimulating exercise. So you all brought up some very valid ideas of, of, how, of what could be extended beyond this particular action that, that the veterinarian has taken to, to, to get these animals in their top form. And I was just going to add to that, too, that, you know, every case so far, I've been very impressed with the answers. You guys are very thoughtful, thinking big picture on all these things. And so kudos to all of you for having put thought into these, even though you didn't have a lot of time. And so basically what I wrote here is that, as you, as you uh, summarized, you know, the, the exercise should not be the only part of this. You should look at what else is going on with managing the weight of the dogs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Ensure that everything is consistent uh, programmatically with the animals as well as with the scientific outcome. <clears throat> okay, case seven. A new investigator brings Dutch belted rabbits with custom-made cages. She monitors growth, activity, serum chemistry, and performance on learning and memory tests. The cages allow the tests to be conducted in the home cage. The animals are socially housed, but the cage height is only 14 inches. She has five years of published data showing consistent growth and behavior for the colony. The rabbits can make all natural, postural, <clears throat> natural postures and postural adjustments. Table seven. Okay. <laughs> okay, so we felt that this was not um, subject to citation by USDA, nor is this a, um, a portable event to OLA. Um, we did have, well, according to the regulations, the cage height is in alignment with the 14 inches, um, but we weren't sure how many rabbits were housed um, you know, per, per group, so if this was in compliance or not. Um, and also we felt that some corrective actions could be for her to remove the rabbits and bring them into a procedure room to collect um, the data instead of doing it in the, in the animal housing room. Thanks. So from a USDA perspective, this is not citable. Um, the animal, the, our requirement for minimum cage height for rabbits, which is in 3.53C, is 14 inches, so it meets our requirements. And then also, um, the scenario stated that the rabbits can make all natural postural adjustments. So again, not reportable. Um, the go this is a perfect example of how the guide allows for performance standards <coughs> with performance measures as demonstrated by this investigator um, in that they are departing from the, the space or housing for this species, the 14 inches versus what the guide says of 16 inches. But as long as there's IACUC review and concurrence that this is the, the best approach to take, you, you all suggested that the data be collected in another room, but there, there also is accommodation for if there were special things in the cage that were necessary for the research, that could be a justification for, for keeping them in this special kind of caging. Um, and as I said before, um, uh, the, the guide's pretty um, generous in allowing for professional ju judgment and experience um, and this idea of, of the IACUC uh, working with the investigator to make uh, things go, go the best they can based on the specific circumstances.
So we actually have a uh, position statement on uh, performance standards and uh, and on cage or pen space as well. And it says uh, during that uh, review, consider performance standards paramount when evaluating the space. And as Pat mentioned, that we would want to see that the IACUC had uh, looked at the situation and approved it based upon looking at the data for those animals. So if all that had been done, there would be no issue with this. Okay, number eight. Um, oh, did we, well, when we get to table nine, you're going to report out on number two. I'm sorry, we forgot to do that. And table 10, you're going to report out on number five. Okay. So, um, case study eight, Facility Z has a robust enrichment program with a large number of varied enrichment items in each animal enclosure for all of the species that they house. Unfortunately, some of the plastic enrichment items are severely worn and chewed up. A juvenile marmoset was able to get a limb caught in a hole in an enrichment device that had been made by wear and tear. The animal was found severely dehydrated during morning observations. Table eight. Nobody's reaching for it. Okay, fine. Um, I just forgot my name. <laughs> it's right. Dino. Oh, yeah, someone would remember my name. Okay. Um, so we're assuming that this juvenile, although injured by the um, worn hole in the enrichment device, was under veterinary care through the treatment. Um, covered species, the... Um, I, I'm still debating whether or not we would consider this USDA citable if he's under veterinary care. Um, there is definitely an issue with the program in regards to the enrichment and enrichment, worn enrichment not being culled. So um, I see, you know, for ALAC definitely reporting for, and I wouldn't report to anyone without establishing a plan of action. So I'd have that in place. So no matter who, if I called USDA, OLA, and ALAC, um, my plan of action would already be in place and would have been established. So, who else has any comment? Okay. I, do you think it's, I don't know. We were debating on the not, whether it's USDA citable or non citable, so I'll okay. leave that kind of up in the air. You want me to tell you? Yes, I do. <laughs> um, this is something that actually may be citable if it were citable be under 3.75C1. And um, that section of the regs state that furniture type fixtures or objects must be sturdily constructed and must be strong enough to provide for the safe activity and welfare of non-human primates. So um, it, because the infant, uh, not the infant, the juvenile marmoset was found in, in a dehydrated state um, that, and was able to get entrapped in the device, um, it was not providing for safe activity. Um, also, later on, under 3.75, um, it also says that when it comes to worn and chewed up enrichment, also be aware, oh wait, um, it also says that um, surfaces must be free of jagged edges or sharp points that might injure animals. And this is all in the, the primate subpart D. So um, depending on the program, it's something that, that might be citable. Um, so we would say not reportable unless serious harm or death. Uh, this one's kind of on the on the edge of being that way, but we would also want to make sure that um, uh, you all get your act together in terms of, of getting rid of those um, less than desirable uh, enrichment items. Um, and the guide specifically talks about injury from ingestion of foreign materials. So that's likely also something that could happen if the animals are chewing them up to the point where they're getting little bits that could cause uh, issues. Uh, and the, the guide has a pretty extensive discussion about this idea um, of all the different things that can go wrong with enrichment. <laughs> so be, be alerted. Okay. 
so you've noticed I've been intentional about uh, bringing up some of our FAQs and position statements, and that's because that's over 50 years worth of, of collective experience. So we're always happy to have you call our office with questions, and uh, you know we often will go back and, and read those FAQs to try to help you come up with an answer. So they're available on our website. Like like I said, call at any time. But if you have a question, oftentimes the answer may be found on our web page in the FAQs and position statements. And this one, uh, the emphasis here is that uh, make sure the program has been implemented properly and that people are adequately trained to, uh, you know, see items that are worn out and need to be replaced. So now we're going to go backtrack to case number five and case number two so that our other two tables get a chance to tell us what they discussed. Uh, table 10 had case study five again. This is the one about the macaque mother infant bonding and the, the uh, idea of what, what should you do when a PI is asking to do this kind of thing. What did you, what did you all came up with? Table 10? Uh, ditto number five table. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> ditto um, Ola, ALAC, and USDA. <laughs> so, okay. um, so our thoughts were very similar that we, um, it had not been IACUC approved yet. It had been reviewed. I think maybe the only other thing that we would add to what they had already said was that um, we felt there should be a, a collective minds um, put together before IACUC considered the amendment. Um, you know, getting veterinary input, but behavioral input, uh, scientific justification, and, and some of the things you guys mentioned as well, talking with either the PI or the client or whoever might be proposing this um, and to see what other options we could have um, instead of this uh, study design, if possible. Great. Thank you. And table nine had number two. Okay. Almost there. Here we go. The, the, the diarrhea always happens kind of question. Is that acceptable or not? What did you all think? So we came to the uh, same conclusion. Uh, the ICOC had not approved anything, uh, so therefore it would not be reportable. Um, I've actually had similar requests at our facility. I, I'm on the ICOC uh, for single housing. And I just told